Ajit. I am your host in the Business Analyst In Demand Facebook group and YouTube channel. And today we're going to cover data migration. I've got so many requests from you guys to talk about data mapping and data migration. So what I've done is I've put together a few slides to kind of walk you through the process, right? Um, the goal is for me to spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about the process, and then we'll open it up to Q&A towards the end. I love interactive sessions, so please um, ask me any questions um, with the caveat that I have been in the industry for many, many years. I myself have not been on a data migration project, but I've been in the industry long enough to know the ins and outs and have managed, um, managed projects um, from a project management standpoint that were related to data migration, okay? So my goal here today is for you guys to give you guys a general understanding of what's involved in data migration, what types of projects involve data mapping and such activities, and then we can go on to Q&A. And if that all sounds good, uh, I will start sharing my screen and we'll get started with the project or with this presentation. All right, so um, what is data mapping and data migration, right? So generally, um, data migration is a process of moving data from one system to another, right? So when we talk about data migration or data mapping, we're essentially making sure that the fields, so all systems, right, have a database on the back end. To give you an example, um, Amazon, I like to use Amazon in my examples because Amazon is something that everybody can relate with. What you see on Amazon is just the products that are available on Amazon, but on the back end is a huge database that lists the name of products, the price point for products, the sellers, right? And even your data as a consumer is all saved in Amazon. So if we were to think about a product or a migration project for Amazon, what we would be concerned about when it comes to data migration is moving all of that data in the database, including the product name, price, seller information, and your consumer information into another type of database, right? So the process of data migration that we think about and we talk about that you may see in job descriptions over and over again is the art of moving data from one database to another type of system or database, okay? So data migration terms that you guys will hear over and over again, I want to go through these a little bit just so you are familiar with them um, and can understand what they mean. So source data, a uh, source system is the original system that the data has been in, right? Target system is the new system where the data needs to go to. So in our Amazon example, your source system would be Amazon, your target system would be another system where we wanna move all of that um, information that relies on the database for Amazon into another area, okay? POC is proof of concept. Um, proof of concept is a method where we test systems um, in smaller chunks and to make sure that um, uh, test systems in smaller pieces and functionality to make sure that it's working appropriately. We do proof of, proof of concept in many different types of projects, not just data migration. But when it comes to data migration projects, proof of concept becomes really, really important because you want to test small pieces of um, data movement before you move the entire like data into another system, right? So we generally do proof of concept on many different types of projects. Um, and um, the goal of proof of concept is to make sure that we um, are testing smaller bits and pieces of functionality before we can, um... you guys, give me one second. I'm getting a lot of messages. Okay, um, on premises. On-premises means that um, requires companies to buy and maintain their own servers in-house, right? So all processes such as maintenance, security, and upgrades are done in-house. In our Amazon example, again, if um, they had on-site servers, this would be known as on-prem. Cloud computing is when we have, storage, we have storage of data applications, databases, and other software 
over the internet. So if, again, going back to our Amazon example, and I would please highly recommend that you all put yourself on mute if you don't have any questions at the moment. Cloud computing is storage of data applications or databases and other software over the internet. So in our Amazon example, if Amazon were to buy their own servers and maintain them um, where they are in their headquarters or in a data warehouse, that would be known as on-prem. If they're outsourcing their um, storage of databases, then that's called cloud computing. API calls um, are a specified time when data communication takes place. Lots of you guys have questions about what are APIs. I already have a video on APIs, I think two videos on APIs on my YouTube channel. Go back and reference those. And if you have more questions, let me know in our group and I'm happy to go into more details about that. With the caveat that as business analysts and scrum masters, you guys don't need to know um, everything about APIs. Um, high level on APIs is, is just a piece of functionality and code that already exists somewhere that we can borrow for our projects. And your developers are the ones that need to know um, a lot of the details around it. From business analysts and scrum master standpoint, all you guys need to know about APIs is um, that they'll be used in your project. You may need to write some requirements on how um, and when to use them, like frequency of um, doing those calls. But um, in your roles as business analysts or scrum master, you guys don't need to know a lot of the specifications that your developers need to worry about. And then batch jobs are generally run after business hours, once a day, and et cetera. Jobs are scheduled to run daily. Any change requirements, uh, any change requires development work generally done for reports and or can be used for input to other systems or output or reports. The reason why I list these things is we are talking about data. We are talking about data moving in and out of other systems. And even when data is not moving in and out of other systems, we do often have um, API calls or batch jobs that are scheduled with our databases to either, um, as I said, to um, send reports to your customers or your clients. And we um, use this for that purpose, okay? The types of data migration projects. Um, this is an image that I took from um, Google um, the goal of this is, uh, I think somebody was trying to do this re React, and I don't know how to remove it from my screen, so we'll just have to um, manage it for now. Types of data migration projects, right? Generally, this, uh, as I said, I took this image from Google, and the goal of this screen is to show you the different types of data migration projects that, that may exist, right? It's not always that we're moving from an old system to a new system. We see data migration types of projects or data mapping types of projects in many, many different scenarios, right? Um, legacy system. Uh, so this is for a legacy system is only one type of um, data, data migration project that you guys may see is where we're moving from one old system to a newer system. Um, storage uh, capacity expansion is another one where we may be moving to a bigger database. Introduction of additional systems. This is where you, your company may be onboarding a SaaS product, right? A, a, a company that does a particular type of service for you. So for example, if you guys have had a in-house CRM and now you're going to Salesforce, um, now you need to map your data within the Salesforce application to make sure that um, your client information is being um, converted appropriately. So that's another type of a data migration or a data mapping project that you may see this in. And then shift in centralized databases, um, moving to the cloud, mergers and acquisitions. Oftentimes when companies merge with other companies, you may um, have to then merge your systems and your data together as well to make it easier for the company and more cost effective to manage a smaller set of databases versus you know, databases from company A and all the databases from company B. So these are all the different types of scenarios and there may be more than that are captured here where you may see you know, data migration type of projects. 
Okay. So here, this screen, um, again, I found on Google, I've given you guys a link so you guys can go read the full article. This is generally the overall approach for a data, data migration project, right? We have three, uh, we have six phases at a high level. We first um, do this analysis and discovery. We extract and profile, we cleanse, we validate, we load, and then we reconcile, right? Um, and these are the general steps that are listed or things that happen in each of the phases. Um, I'm not gonna read through a lot of this. You guys can um, read this article in depth on your own time, but just as an overall um, process, we generally, we're, we're talking about um, either moving data or merging data, right? So these projects are where you generally will have a data analyst on your team. You generally will have lots of people that are focused very, very closely with data. Um, sometimes business analysts and data uh, analyst roles are very, very closely aligned, but generally um, for any type of data migration, you will have um, somebody whose primary role it is, is to be um, mapping this type of data, okay? So let's look at just the first few analysis and discovery. This is where we um, analyze source systems. Remember I gave you a definition source system is this, the old system, right? Where you are pulling data from, review existing documentation, gather relevant metadata, right? Extract and profile. This is where we extract master and transactional data we call them uh, column profiling analysis, dependencies, uniqueness, redundancy analysis, frequency distribution, data patterns, and data quality assessment. What this is saying is, um, remember I, I mentioned reports a little bit here. So APA calls and batch jobs. These are um, jobs that are scheduled. And um, Actually, can I have a volunteer who uh, can mute anybody um, that is coming in? Uh, any volunteers? Tayo, can I mute? Yep. Can I? Who who is going to volunteer? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be looking. Okay, Cash. Okay, Cash. I'm going to make you um, the host as well, so that way you can continue to. Um, you can continue to mute people as they come in. Thank you, Cash. So I lost my train of thought. Um, I was here, frequency distribution, data patterns, and data quality assessment. So you guys remember I talked about API calls and batch jobs. These are jobs that are run on the database, uh, generally that you're probably trying to move data out of. And these, are, these could be um, daily reports that are running to um, for example, say on, um, let me think about an example for, from an Amazon standpoint. So Amazon may have batch jobs where they're reporting daily sales reports that are coming in, right? Or they may be Subject, so, can you can, can you get, hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I don't know what was the last thing I said. Okay, let's start over. Um, so I had started to talk about the frequency of distribution, right? Um, that all relates to any jobs that may be created or scheduled on your systems, right? So anytime when we're thinking about moving databases, um, and anything related from an, a, a system such as uh, mainframe systems, you have to take into consideration any jobs that are being scheduled or are, are in place. And um, batch jobs could be a list of reports that are um, daily reports, weekly reports, uh, monthly or annual reports that come out of the system. So when you're talking about or planning a data migration project, you have to be concerned and understand what reports are being generated out of that system, okay? When we um, do cleansing uh, phase, we cleanse data based on business rules, 
um, any uh, so business rules are just give you guys a general understanding business rules are rules that um, indicate how uh, that data or the trigger points for that data. So an example of a business rule is um, for a banking application. So when you are approved for a mortgage, there may be five things that the bank looks at, right? Your credit score, um, criteria A, B, C, D, and F. So your business rules will define how um, those criteria will impact your approval process for the loan or your denial of that loan. Okay. And then validate is where we preload reports, preload error reports, and business sign off. This is where um, I was talking about proof of concept. When we validate, we want to um, move small pieces or merge small pieces of data to make sure that we're headed in the right direction. We don't want to take a whole system and without any testing, move it over because that could be a recipe for disaster. And then um, load is where we load the data to the target system, which is the new system we want. We ex um, make sure we pay attention to exception handling. Exception handling is uh, where we may see that the data either is not mapped over appropriately or we're seeing some errors. You may get some defects. So this is a process of us going back and reviewing where the issue may have occurred, okay? So um, in um, all of these steps, I, I try to um, give you guys a synopsis of and examples of what may happen. So we'll just go through those really quickly, right? So in the analyze and discovery phase, we create a data dictionary of the source system, right? So um, if you guys are not familiar with what a data dictionary is, it's a listing of all of your data attributes, right? Um, so an attribute name, maybe contact name, contact email. So any data field that is in the database should be in a data dictionary. So if you're working on a data migration project, your first thing to do is to create a data dictionary that lists all of the fields in the database. We list whether those fields are required or not required, the type of data that is in that field, right? right? Whether it's numeric, if it's a text, email, or a phone number, or any other transactional logic if there are any. So this is an example of um, an image I probably took off of Google somewhere for a data dictionary. If you guys are not familiar with what data dictionaries are, um, Google is still my best friend, you guys. I use it a lot. And after looking at Google, if you guys still have some questions around data dictionaries, put it in our Facebook group and I'll be happy to respond. Extract and um, profile. This is where we work with business systems analysts or a data analysts that may be on the project to understand how and where the data is being communicated between systems, right? Just because we have um, a huge database doesn't mean that that database is only used for one system. Oftentimes we have lots of systems talking to one another, right? To make sure that the end product works. So this is where your systems analysts or your operations teams or your data analysts may be able to look at the database uh, or systems and understand, okay, this, this, this thing is being used in this application and then downstream that application and that application as well, right? So they should be able to gather that information for you and give that information to you. And this is where, remember you guys, I, I started to talk about, you know, batch jobs being created. Um, that's another function where you may be seeing um, reports that are being run if you um, ask for help and understand where all the downstream data is going. Cleanse data, this is where you create a data dictionary of the target system plus data mapping at the first level. Uh, cleansing data means that we do deduplication, which means that if our target system and our source, uh, our source system and our target system, you know, um, let me back up. So deduplication is where we're removing duplicates from the database, right? If we're merging data from many different systems, you may see that um, like, let's say for merging data from like two or three systems, uh, customer name may be in all three um, systems. Now we don't need um, that field in three times. We need to identify which field we're gonna stick with and which um, uh, a format that we're gonna use it in, okay? We're going to do deduplication, matching, and merging uh, of products. 
Source to target field mapping and documents include business rules and conversation logic to guide the development and cleansing of transformations. So I talked about business rules a little bit here in this slide um, right here, uh, right here. Um, that's the key, you guys, when we're moving things over, we need to make sure that um, we are identifying the source, the target, um, the frequency of how this data is being used and also the business rules, right? Validate, we create a proof of concept to test model data transfer slash mapping exercises. We validate, a validation must be signed off from business teams or functional teams. So um, this is an example that I had put together. So this is the source system. This is the target system. You have um, this um, system A, right? Um, system, this is all system A. So what was I trying to do here? So, um, from source system to the target system, I had identified a uh, meds, date of birth, meds. So you know what, I think I was trying to showcase this is system A, B, system B, system C, and system C, uh, D. From here, we were pulling these informations um, and this is something that's being pulled um, through APIs and this is something that's being pulled through a batch process. Batch job or batch process are the synonymous, which means that they are used interchangeably. And we have to make sure that when we're pulling data um, from a target system that we, um, again, are testing it and making sure that it, it works appropriately. Load um, and data feed, uh, load, data feed migration. So once we have business sign off, so we do the proof of concept, we get business sign off, data loads occur according to the data migration plan or cutover plan, right? We review the data exception reports, um, which provide details on what data was not successful. Um, on data migration type of projects, we have um, data exception reports to help us, like what did not map over? What is left? And that's how we can do some um, analysis to figure out what else needs to happen, what did we miss potentially. And then um, offline transfer and online transfer. Offline transfer is where um, the customer owned devices like hard drives are shipped um, to the company or the cloud provider or the company slash cloud provider. Usually then they destroy the data um, before, after they load it. And then online transfer is where we're transferring the data over the network. Um, and it may impact the network bandwidth. So when we do large scale projects and we cut over um, large scale projects, we do them after hours. So that way we don't impact the network bandwidth too much. Okay, things to consider, um, reports and frequency of reports. I, I stress this a lot and it's because it's really important. A lot of people miss this. We generally with um, older systems, especially what that we're trying to um, move data over into cloud computing or newer systems, we forget about the, the reports that are being run with our source systems. And often um, that could cause lots of issues. And so in my experience, um, I face this a lot. So that's why I keep mentioning that. And then business rules and business transactions happening on the back end. That those are other very, very important concepts or things that you guys should consider when working on or planning these projects. Um, so example business rules for a report, um, a customer report, uh, a report for a customer uh, who reports less than 120,000 salary. So this is a, a batch report that a bank or a lender may be running on their back end. So what you would have on this type of report is your, the customer first name plus customer last name, customer address, phone number, employer, customer annual salary less than 120K plus a credit score of whatever, customer data within the last 60 days of the application. Um, so today's date minus 60 days. And then this report for customers who reported um, you know, le uh, less than 60K. So these are the types of batch jobs that your company um, uh, or your target or source systems may be running in the background. So when you're moving all of this stuff over, you wanna be mindful of the reports that are also running from that system. And that's all I have prepared for you guys. Any questions on that? And it seems like everybody wants to message me right now while I'm going live. So you, if you guys 
have been hearing those pings. Um, I apologize for that. All right, what questions do you guys have for me? Hi, Sarati, from India, how are you? Good. Good. Thanks. So my question is regarding this offline online transfer. See, on my phone is being so I'll put it on mute. <laughs> so, 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 so this is offline transaction, right? So I was not getting the point of offline. So there is a batch process, as you said. So when is when you say batch process, which is a timely transfer of the information from one source to other, or an intermediate data where it pull it into a, a layer and then send it across. And online is that every time you you refresh the database, you're going to get it. If the batch is going to run, you know, if it's every every timely manner. But that offline, I was trying to correlate with the batch, but I didn't I didn't understand the point what we're trying to make. So, so can offline, you just tell me? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I should have specified better. So offline is when we're moving. Um, so batch jobs are online and they're uh, scheduled, right? Um, offline transfer is when, let's say, Amazon wants to move all of their data into another data center, right? So offline transfer is when we then load all that data on hard drives and physically move it to another data center is offline transfer. I'm very surprised that do we still do that because we, we are in the age where- Yes, uh, you guys would be surprised. There's a lot of companies that do offline transfers. Uh, could be because of regulatory compliance requirements that, you know, um, that that's what they're required to do. I worked for um, State of California Correctional Health Department, and we had an old database. And the only way that we could get data out of that database was to do an offline transfer. So we had to load data on hard drives, ship it, um, you know, FedEx and whatever the other, you know, methods were um, for them to physically load the data. So uh, the question is, is it still happening today? Uh, yeah, it is. I know that uh, in today's day and age, we all are very versed with cloud computing, but um, offline transfers do take place. Then in that case, sorry, I'm explaining. I'm the only person uh, asking the question, so sorry. So in the, in the exchange of the question, so so when you say, when you're doing testing, right? When you also did, did some sampling testing to check those data, so we already have an uh, issue with the batch and the uh, regular timing where the data might miss out, the batch might miss out. You may not get the regular uh, data updated refresh. We might have to do a lot of reconciliation, which is even more tougher. And Absolutely. what you're feeling is an even more tougher task. So how would you, you, you will not, no BA can in the world can give a perfect uh, uh, testing package for those things. Definitely not. Even though you're, you're Superman or something, uh, yeah. you're not going to get a you're not going to get a re reconciled answer for getting to do the testing so so what i what couldn't did, imagine that so yeah please well please. i'll give you an example of what we did for the data that we needed to transfer um offline what we did was we loaded on the um on the drive um like 500 records for a so these were prisoners right um, it was a system for um, our um, correctional health um, health database. So we loaded records for 500 patients and we sent those across, right, to be loaded. And so when those um, uh, records for 500 patients were loaded into the new system, we just had to validate and make sure that the data was uh, coming over appropriately. Um, is there a 100% one-to-one um, should be, does it always happen? No, but that's where we continue to work. And the system that we were taking data off of was a really, really old system. And that's generally the situations that you will face is the systems that you're trying to take data out of are generally pretty, pretty archaic and old. And um, that's probably the reason why we had to do offline transfers um, to move that data over. What about the data processing methods, right? What you said, data cleansing. So that will not be happening at all. So in that case, you get the raw data, you dump in the new new, uh, new database. So the, the whole process that you mentioned it apart, you will not be able to do the data. You are not defining it. You're just no, no, no. Device. So you, you, you can't just dump data into a new database, right? So there's a level of analysis that's happening. I talked about data. Um, data mapping, right? Data dictionaries and data mapping. So that level of work happens before you dump data into the new system, because Perfect. that's how we can um, identify, okay, um, prisoner first name or prisoner last name, if, and I'm not a data analyst, so I'm not gonna speak too much into detail about this Praveen, right? But 
um, what I'm trying to do is give you guys an understanding of the process that data migration projects take place, right? So generally we, we understand this old database that had a lot of the data for um, our patients, right? And now we need to move this to our new system, which was a Cerner system uh, is a SaaS product. So what we had to do was understand all the data fields from the source system, the old database, and how data was being represented. So we had to look at, okay, name, last name, um, their allergies, their medications that they were getting, and what are the fields where that data is being stored? And then on the SaaS product, where does that, so the name, which field on our SaaS product field needs to go there, right? Mapping. Allergies. Mapping. Okay. mapping, data mapping. Mapping, that right. That, that data mapping has to happen before, before we bump like dump it because that's where your developers will, when they're transferring the data or loading the data, that's how they will know how to put data into the right um, fields where it belongs. Great, so I've never seen a physical migration, but it's a very challenging task as well, so thank you. And uh, I have one more question on, mm -hmm. on the data cleansing part of it. Once you said you're gonna identify, you're gonna create uh, the data structures there, right? Uh, yeah. What is the data structure? You said that's a data dictionary. And the cleansing yeah. part, you added all the data dictionary along with the sources. So when you define on the defining step itself, you've already done those data dictionary itself. So you're defining the sources, you're defining the field, you define, which means that you're defining uh, what is that, say, example, is a mobile. So you want to define that mobile, what is the character length, what is that the value allowed in. So what is the dropout, what is the, what is the length, everything you've already been done it. So point number three, you said you're doing the data cleansing along with the step one. What is that that I'm missing or what is that I'm not getting there? So that? again, I said I'm not a data analyst. I have not done these um, myself. Um, I've managed data migration projects from a PM standpoint. So um, I, uh, an example that I can give you is when you're mapping um, the data cleansing could be, you know, we decide that we're just not going to take some of the systems or some of the data that's in the old system over to the new system, A, because it's not relevant, or B, it's because it's maybe too old um, of an information to move over. So data cleansing, these are the types of things that we look at and make sure, um, do we even move that data over or we don't, right? So it may come over if we're talking about the offline batch, right? Uh, the data just may come together because it's mapped or contained in one of, you know, in the same records, but we can decide to not take that into the new systems because A, uh, maybe it doesn't make sense. So what I understand is a validation step that you're going through. That's what I, I, I yeah. tend to understand that you're, you're, you're mentioning here. Okay. Yeah. Those are great questions. Great job. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sorry, sir, I have one question. Actually, Sorry. myself, Karthik Kiran, that uh, APIs they used to, uh, the tool, it's for uh, only for retail banking, I hope so, right? I'm sorry? The APIs, that application they use basically for retail banking or else for? Uh, no, APIs are used um, for all industries, all domains. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ash, you had a question? Uh, uh, um, yes, go ahead cash <laughs> yes sir. so my question well it was just a, a quick sort of summary in my head as well so suppose i land on a um uh, like a, a, a migration project the first thing i will look to do which will be my as is is uh, to see if they have a data dictionary um, and then go through the process of uh, maybe speaking to an sme to see what what fields are still relevant so that'll be the uh, uh cleansing part yeah and then uh, speaking to, would i as the ba i wouldn't know the source system exactly where the data needs to be transferred to or mapped to so again would i then pair up with an sme to yeah say, okay, this this uh, fields or this yeah. uh, be mapped to uh, that particular field so therefore, that will be my to be. So I suppose my my uh, um, uh, my data dictionary will contain my as is and to be um, 
both of those processes on that data dictionary and that will help me to understand what the um say the legacy system and what the uh source system will be yeah so in a nutshell um great question cash um we generally as business analysts or scrum masters never work alone right we always have um people that we're working with um i'm gonna put somebody on mute that i think is uh, there's or cash i think only you can do that there's lots of background noise so if you guys can put yourself on mute that would be awesome okay thank you so um, that's a great question. Generally, we always have subject matter experts, um, and especially when you're working on a data migration project, you will have a lot of technical resources available to you while you're doing this work. You may have data architects, you may have a solution architect, you may have lots of other people to help and support this project because these are projects that are generally very large and impact a lot of systems, right? So your question is, you know, your, your target uh, your source system is your as is and your target system is your to be right now when you have a target system usually it's going to be a SaaS product um, generally right or a cloud computing type of a system so generally like th th if you think of a SaaS solution your target fields are already defined and all are already you know there's um you will know, okay, well, the name character can be 30 characters in length. The last name can be X number of characters. So you already know what, um, and your SaaS um, companies that you guys are onboarding will give you that data because they, the, the, their project will only be successful if we're able to map the data appropriately. So they, you will also have resources from the SaaS company to help you make this data transformation or data migration process easier, right? Does that help answer your question, Cash? So from a target system, you already know what fields are needed, right? which fields are required. So then it makes the process a little easier to look at your source data and identify, okay, first name and name will map here right? Yep. Maybe we do first name and last name separately, or we do them together. So when they're mapping that data over, and I'm using really easy examples, you guys, right? They mm -hmm. will have to figure out when they're moving the data and whether to put that first and last name in different fields based on the target system requirements. But the yep. goal is, the goal is to map the data over appropriately so that there's not an impact to the business, right? not an impact to reports or other systems that may be using that data when we move it over. Yeah, totally get that, uh, understand that. And I think uh, um, I think probably generally as well, uh, how, what I found is that um, as the BA, you, you can't know all this yourself. You all, mm -hmm. there's always, um, especially like a micro, migration project, you, you, you definitely won't know all of this. So yeah. Uh, it's good to sort of be open and like uh, uh, get help from an SME. Um, yeah. And I, I think uh, just for the other guys as well, nobody will ever no a BA will never ever know everything about a migration project. So it's good to have that uh, help from uh, the uh, help from a specialist. Absolutely, you will always have uh, resources available as a business analyst. You're never trying to build systems or migrate data by yourself, right? Um, you don't know enough, you're not in the day-to-day, -day, so you definitely will have resources available for your um, help and support. Thank you. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah, um, I dropped a question. I think you didn't say it, so I'll just probably ask away. Okay. Um, so, um, so I'm wondering at what point or how one gets to tell developers, you know, what to do when you're carrying out this um, migration project. So for instance, I'm currently working on a legacy migration project, right, where the front end and the back end of the system, um, they're on, um, they're on prem, right, and I'm trying to move these into a new um, a new database, right? Mm -hmm. A new data center. So, um, where do where does 
things like user stories after you've done all of your analysis how do you then communicate what needs to be done to the developers i i, I will i be the one to um, talk through the process of what needs to be done first you know do we move do we do the uh, test system first and then we now move to live you know how do i engage developers you, as to the have, progress have you that's a um, i'm glad you're we're talking about this have you um done your data mapping exercise already yeah so yeah so i've looked at um yeah my structures the databases and the systems that interact with the system it's actually a um a document management system Okay. So the actual the actual documents are in a specific um, folder within a server. Okay. Now it also has a database that maps to each of those PDF documents. Okay. So after doing all of that, um, you know, I, I'm wondering how do I then tell the developers so what to start have, with? Have you started talking to the developers yet, or no? Um, well, it was just more like um, an initial stakeholder conversation to let developers know what I'm working okay. on. I would definitely um, continue talking more to them. It sounds like you have a lot of information available, but I, it doesn't sound like you have done that mapping exercise, right? Because when we come talk about data migration projects, generally um, you need to work with developers really closely and go through that, that data mapping to make sure that they understand. They will have a bunch of questions for you because they that's what they're kind of gonna rely on to you know, understand and un, uh, code how that data needs to be moved over. So I would highly recommend that you get started on the data mapping exercise. You continue to meet with their developers regularly and you know, start talking about the data mapping exercise because they will have more questions for you, which will require more analysis or more input from their stakeholders or you know, the owners of, um, you may have, generally the way that it works is when we have databases, we have an operations team that manages those databases. So probably what you also need to do is pull in those operations uh, folks that are managing those databases today to help you with this data mapping exercise as well and you know continue talking to the developers um, sometimes you don't need user stories for data migration projects right they may want to see requirements in a different format so i would continue talking with them meet with them regularly um, show them the progress that you've made and ask them what else they need from you all right helpful thank you yeah and let me know how it goes, okay? Okay, absolutely, thanks. Okay, all right guys, any more questions for me? Uh, sorry, just one more for me as well, please, sorry. So I've done my data um, mapping and now it's time for development. Okay. Um, so I've had, the, I've had a chat with the development team. So sorry, this is just a scenario I'm talking about. Um, so I've had a chat with the development team and we've decided we're working in say Scrum and it's been agreed what the priorities will be. So we'll, do we then split the, say, data dictionary up, say we'll do the first, I don't know, six, seven lines of the data dictionary first, that'll be as one, say, JIRA ticket, and then the next seven, eight, uh, uh, we'll do that in another ticket. Uh, so the POs prioritized what goes into the backlog and what needs to be done first. Is that um, how we do those tickets up? Is that how we work? No. The <laughs> no. Okay. So are you are you talking about um, looking at one to six lines uh, just to review the the database uh, the data dictionaries, or are you talking about moving the data over? Um, so we've I'm um, just just a scenario that that we've done the thing okay. um, and uh, when we begin to develop, it's following on from Idris's question, I guess. When we begin to do the development, how do we do? I've had a discussion with the. Uh, um, Developers, I've documented, say, like I've used Jira, so um, I've, in Jira, I've documented what needs to be done. So okay. does that, is it a case of like moving those tickets into a backlog and then just working working from there? So I, I will give you a general answer to that um, from a process and approach standpoint, Cash, and um, let me know if that doesn't um, provide the clarification or clarity that you need, okay? So if you have had in-depth conversations with your developers and they understand the data dictionary and they understand next steps, 
right? What I would um, suggest is that you do a small proof of concept to test, you know, maybe um, in our example, we did 500 records. We moved 500 um, records um, from our old database to the new one and try to analyze if the data was mapping over correctly, right? So for your MVP, I would suggest that you, if the conversations about the data dictionaries and data mapping have already happened and everybody's clear on what needs to happen, then I would um, have a small POC, um, have your business teams validate. It's so important that you have your business teams validate the proof of concept. A lot of times that gets missed and it creates a lot of issues on, you know, if you try to move, uh, you do a small proof of concept, all the techie IT people working on the project look at it, you never involve the business, uh, that becomes a problem. So make sure your business validates. And once they do, then generally data migration projects aren't things that where you can move six lines um, from a data dictionary in one ticket, and then they generally happen together because we want to keep the data together. We want to make sure that it's going to map over appropriately and then move it together. Yeah, no, that, that yeah, definitely. That makes sense. That. And I suppose, uh, it, does it happen that, say, you might have 500 records and then you, the proof of concept is uh, is validated and it's good for the business? Then would you would you maybe do, like, on a higher scale, do 1,000 records and then do 1,500 records no. and keep doing it? Or is it just no. as, as long, and, yeah, as long as the, um, the validation passes. So I have been in situations, um, I used to work for the unemployment office for California, and this is where we were processing COVID payments, depends on the system capacity, right? Um, large scale data migration projects, if they're happening over the network will happen after hours, but let's say if it's gonna take 48 hours, if it takes a long time that you may want to uh, you work with the developers, you guys may be able to batch it, right? Um, but generally, uh, if there is capacity over the network, you want to move it all together once over a couple of hours. If it's going to take days, then you work with your developers to batch it. But it shouldn't be a thousand records or fifteen hundred. It's whatever your system has the capacity to take. So it's mo more on system resources versus we we just want to transfer this many records because you just don't want to take um, a long time moving this data over. If your system can handle it, then push it over. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Sure, I just want to have a few more points that what you said, what Kash and uh, Krishna. So why, when will you do this transaction? When will you speak to those persons? So the first point, the artifact is the data mapping, right? So when the data mapping is done, you will come to know uh, you would probably come to know, as you rightly said, the once the discovery phase is on, as and when you speak with the developers, whether the content, what you've done is good enough or bad enough or worthy enough or not, that's that's going to be the right right path. So I'm just differing for a slight less point of saying that on the go of a scrum, you don't have a time for a POC. So what what the best you can do or what the right right thing, as you, as you rightly said, right? Your data mapping will speak volumes of what you've done or your mistakes or you're done. So when you do the data mapping, you already know the source and target. So the, from the business point of view, we were also talking about the uh, the regulators. So as and when we know the what regulators want from out of this requirement, once we get the data or the or the field, whether through various sources, whether logical step, a business rule, or one-to-one -one mapping, or a transformation logic, once that is done, uh, we we will get a confidence and we will be able to comfortably present to the developers. Yes, there might be issues that the way you're presenting or maybe articulate is or the way they understand it, that's fine. But but that's the way, that's the idea, that's a pivotal point in which a business analyst has to take a call. Yes, yes, this is the point in which that we will have a internal discussion to understand the process or the to to do uh, things is what I would I would say. Sorry, you have you have any more points to add or you didn't yeah, I, I would say I would I would say I would add on to that and say, you know, oftentimes um, from our standpoint, and we are folks that are project managers, business analysts, systems analysts, um, scrum masters, everything could look perfect from our standpoint, and it could fail at POC. And we'd rather have it fail at POC than to, you know, create havoc for the company, right? Um, so that's everything you said is right. Like we 
always are working in teams and collaborating and validating and making sure that we're doing the right thing. But oftentimes, proof of concept is where we get the most feedback from. And um, I've done that in all of my career. Uh, it's more of like a cover your ass type of a situation as well, just so you don't create havoc for the company. But I would highly, highly recommend doing a proof of concept. Yeah, that that will will help you know what exactly the business requirement is is mean. So here, data plays a more important role. We speak the we 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 understand the requirement through data. The business is there, the source is there. You understand where the domain you're talking about. When you transform that into data, that's where the challenges. That's where exactly we'll we know exactly. where we stand exactly. exactly. That's where we stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. All right, guys. I've got to go. Um, any one last question you guys may have, and I love this interaction. So please let me know what other topics we can talk about. Um, I've gone through a lot this summer uh, with my personal life, um, so I haven't been as available as I would love to be. But um, trying to make sure that I put this on the forefront. So let me know what other topics um, we can talk about, and then keep bringing those questions to the group, post the questions in the group. Um, and I will um, always uh, try to plan for these sessions more often in frequency as well. Okay. NHS, I'm going to ask the question. So NHS, you said one last, so I'm going to throw the dice on to, so, uh, to you. So when you said data, data migration projects, so as you rightly said, data migration, so we need to understand the data models. So right the, the second second step of yours is, is exploring and understanding so yeah so uh, all the persons who are, who are talking about what is as is is understand the existing model of why and how and where and how what it can be structured from there only will we come to know what is to be okay when you say data migration is is not that you're going to under nobody is going to give you on a sme is not going to give it on place you we are going to dig down on one hand and do our hands dirty honestly that's a practical experience and understand the process so which means that what is the logical model what is the physical model let's not go to physical model it's too deeper let's not touch upon i'm still stick my guns to logical model in the logical model, there are two things are there one is the transaction model one is an article model so if we can dive deep in the next session, if you have time, it will, it will be in I won't. <laughs> For me, I won't. I'm not a data analyst. I've never um, worked the, as a data the, analyst. So I won't go into details of these logical and you know transactional models. So um, that's not what business analysts do. So that's not um, something that I'm going to go deep on. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, you guys? Anybody except for Praveen, because you've asked a lot. <laughs> I want to make sure other people have a chance to ask questions too. Well, right. Can I ask a question? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, sorry, sir. One thing you touched on, uh, um, and recently I came across in my role as well, that uh, not everything has a user story. Not yeah. every single sort of uh, requirement will be written as a, as a user I want to, so that... Yeah. Generally, uh, yeah, yeah, generally technical requirements don't require user stories. Yes, yes. I, I came to know that quite recently and uh, that made my mind at rest, put my mind at rest because uh, I was speaking to a lot of developers and then when they were dialecting with me, I, I just thought, how am I going to actually put this into a user story? But one of the coaches there helped me and he said, well, not every, uh, uh, not every requirement is a user story. So for anyone else out there as well, not every single requirement will yeah. be written as, as a user, I want to show that. Yeah, so user stories are generally from a user-centric standpoint, yeah. right? And so when we're talking about technical requirements like building mm -hmm. a database and such, so those don't require user stories. That's why I had suggested um, when we were talking about your project scenario is to talk to your developers and ask them what they want from you. What, how are they expecting you to document these requirements? How are they expecting you to, you know, what is the, what do they need from you um, so they can, you know, go ahead and start their coding efforts or start their map mapping efforts. So yeah, Excellent. absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you called out on that cash because technical requirements generally don't need user stories. No, thanks for that. Thanks for the session, sir. It'd be really good, thank you. No worries, I'm glad. All right, guys, I gotta go. Thank you all for being here and for taking out time from your personal lives over the weekend. I work full time still, so um, weekends are the only times that I can make these sessions. So I am greatly appreciative to you guys and for all the questions. 
um, it actually makes the videos a lot better when there's interaction and questions because the questions that you guys have are probably the same questions that other people may have when they're watching these on YouTube. So it actually enhances these videos quite a bit. So I appreciate you guys um, always. And with that, I hope you guys have a more, uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend, whatever that may look like. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.